Yeah. Okay. It's you should be able to see. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we'll I will make it a full screen like this. Yeah. 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 Shall I shall I keep it like that already or? No. No. Uh, after I first yeah. don't uh, please yeah. close it and after. Yes. Uh, I you start it, then yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. Yeah. then I will open it and, and yeah. then we'll yeah. work through it. No problem. Uh, so it's just one one small thing. I'm I'm very bad at pronouncing the foreign surnames. Names. Yeah, I know this is normal thing. Uh, my oh, Conrad yeah. is just Conrad, like oh, Joseph right. Conrad, yeah. and then my mm. surname is uh, Penjiviat. Pendi? Pendiviat. Pendiviat. Yeah, don't look at how it's written. Try to just okay. uh, say it. Okay. okay. Pen, <laughs> pen, pen, di, viat. Pendi viat. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So some of my, my Russian background helps. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm, uh, we will start now. Can you start the recording? Uh, we will start now. Can you start recording? Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, uh, dear viewers of uh, the World Muslim Community Councils, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lovely evening again uh, uh, in online uh, in Abu Dhabi time. And uh, this is our last. Uh, online lecture uh, for a year 2020. And today we had a great honor to have a, a renewed scholar and research from uh, Holland, um, Professor Korat Podazewicz, a senior researcher at the Center for Advanced Studies of Population and Religion, and a professor in the Department of International Affairs of Karakow University in Poland, uh, Karakow University of Economics, yeah, in Poland. Professor Korak uh, is a author of numerous publications on religion and ethnicity in the process of migration, Islam and Muslims in Europe. And uh, he also focused on the politicization of uh, Islam in Europe and Middle East and North Africa. Uh, he has published many monographs like uh, Muslim in Western Europe in 2007 and New Muslim Elite in, in European Cities in 2010, Polish Migration Policy in 2015, and more recently, uh, The Transformation of Islamism in Egypt and Tunis uh, in the Shadow of the Arab Spring. So with his uh, uh, impressive resume, you can see uh, Professor Korad is really an expert on Islam and Muslim in Europe. Today, he will bring to us the lecture on Islam and Muslim citizenship in Europe. Uh, I'm sure many viewers here and uh, like uh, many other brothers and sisters in the world has been very concerned and witnesses uh, some development and uh, um, events happening uh, in Europe and uh, to Muslim communities and to the society at large there. So today we would like to hear from Professor Korat to interpret this and in a very academic and scholarly with uh, rich uh, knowledge and uh, uh, accurate historical background to understand uh, Muslim and uh, Muslim communities and Islamic uh, practice uh, in Europe. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Cora. Um, thank you very much, uh, Shaojin, for this kind uh, invitation and introduction. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, present some of my work to the World Muslim Communities Council. Um, what um, I want to do in this uh, time allocated, uh, I want to thank you, um, to the tour in Europe um, and to tell you a little bit about the, the, the situation of uh, Muslims in Europe and also about the 
uh, Muslim citizenship as far as I, I see it. Um, what I'm going to do within this uh, 45 minutes to one hour is uh, I'm going to tell you about um, a little bit about the history of, uh, of Islam in Europe. It is very important to understand the, and the, to have the, the historical perspective while we look at the even current uh, events in Europe. So first I'll very briefly uh, say a few things about, about European past uh, from medieval times up until today. Then I'll uh, say a little bit about biggest Muslim populations in contemporary Western Europe. And also I will give you a snapshot of the of a smaller community, but super interesting that we have in Poland. And um, then I'll uh, then I'll go and, and talk about transformations within Islam in contemporary Western Europe. And the very important questions uh, that is uh, in the minds of many Muslims uh, in Europe and outside is the stigmatization uh, of Muslims um, in the face of various types of uh, terrorist attacks uh, carried out in the name of, uh, of, of Islam and um, increasing mobilization of young European Muslims around religious identity. And this is the, the last part of, the, of, the, of my presentation today will be devoted to, to this uh, um, issue of Muslim citizenship as far as I see it. So the very first slide um, is uh, probably you recognize at least one of these photos, which is on the first slide. And, uh, and the photo obviously is the interior of the Mesquita, which is nowadays the cathedral in Cordoba. And, uh, and this is obviously, this is the, the glorious past of, of, of Islam in, 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 in Europe, in Andalusia, which I'm going to, to say a few words at the very beginning about. But then the second photo, which you may not recognize, but you clearly can recognize the same pattern, the same, um, the same type of, uh, of uh, architectural work. Obviously it's mihrab here, it's, it's something uh, on the top is, is something else, but this is obviously the, the idea is to revive in a way this, this, this past. And this is a mihrab in, in the, in the uh, masjid, in mosque, uh, uh, which was opened in 2003 in Grenada. Uh, so after more than 500 years of, of, uh, of Muslim absence in, in the city of Grenada, the mosque was open, a beautiful mosque. And, and this is the masjid of this mosque. And I think this is, these two photos very nicely um, uh, talk about the past, and the present, which will be the, the case of my lecture today. So when we, when we search and look at the presence of Muslims in Europe um, from Jorgen Nielsen uh, and Felice D'Assetto, the pioneers of Islam, of, of, of research on Islam in Europe, what, what we normally uh, see is this, um, uh, the, the, the delineation of the faces of the Muslim presence in Europe. And, uh, and what I will be discussing today is mostly the so-called fourth phase, which is the migration of Muslims to Europe, mostly after the Second World War, which is a mass immigration. It has been taking place already in the, uh, before the Second World War, uh, less probably explored, but obviously this, that demographically, it was not so important as it is happening after the Second World War. And, and, uh, and what makes the, the huge Muslim populations in contemporary Europe. But also we shouldn't forget about earlier faces um, that have also left not only architectural, cultural uh, remainings in, in, uh, in Europe, but also societal like demographic uh, uh, remains. And, and here I mean, especially the periods that I won't be exploring, but I will, I'll give you an example of the Muslim community in Poland, which is partially an example of this case, which is the, 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 the second phase, the golden horde, uh, and to some small extent expansion of the, of the Ottoman empire 
uh, but mostly this concerns Southern Europe more than, than, than Central Europe, um, where this uh, presence uh, uh, has not really left uh, any significant uh, remaining. So starting from, from the past, um, the, the very presence of, of Islam in, in, in Europe starts uh, in medieval Sicily and, and, and Spain. The first uh, Muslim visits to the island are, are being uh, uh, recorded already in the seventh century. And then the very important expedition of the Euphemius and Ziyar Allah takes place in 1827. And at a certain moment in this, in this uh, Muslim rule in, in Sicily, the, the, the power of the rulers of uh, Muslim rulers of, of Sicily is so big that even the the Vatican uh, needs to pay a tribute um, to, uh, to them. And uh, the Renaissance is, is normally considered as, as a 10th century uh, when in Palermo only, uh, there were, according to the historical um, records, around 300 mosques. And here, what you see obviously on this photo is, is, uh, is today's cathedral in Palermo, but Similarly to the situation, for example, in Seville uh, or in any on some other uh, Spanish uh, cities, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, parts of the cathedrals are former uh, former mosques. Or the case of of Mesquita that I showed at the very beginning in, in Alhambra. So when the the Normans with Roger the First uh, take over at the end of 11th century, Islam is is very much an Arabic. Um, culture is very much part of the Sicilian reality to such an extent that even if you look at the historical um, uh, artifacts, you will see that, that, for example, the Normans have been, um, have been um, using Arabic language uh, in, in their scripture and they've taken the, the Arabic culture as, 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 as a, uh, and was part of the, of the how society works. The city, and what is important in this presence that probably many of, of, of the uh, viewers know is that the, the, the length of this, uh, which is often forgotten, that Muslims have been part of the, uh, of the European society for so many centuries. And, and obviously the Reconquista was taking place and, and, and for example, Cordoba was lost uh, um, uh, in uh, 1236, but, uh, uh, but still um, it, uh, it was up until the end of the 15th century that Muslims ruled uh, from obviously the beginning of uh, 8th century and, uh, and the um, military expedition of Tariq bin Zayed. Uh, refers to this historical beginning of Muslims in, in, uh, in, um, in Spain. Uh, what is interesting about this presence is one of the many interesting books uh, on the subject, uh, one of them uh, 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 wrote by Richard Bullitt that shows how the society in, of Al-Andalus was being Islamized. And, and he looks into the construction of mosques and how various communities um, where and, and also the, the special records that show how the names have been changing from the Visigothic to Arabic names. And on the basis of this, uh, on the basis of this historical uh, records, he's able to establish the speed of the of the, the pace of the of the uh, of the Islamization of the society. And interestingly, one may see that. Uh, there was obviously no forcible conversion of the people of the book. The, what worked mostly was the social and economic incentives and social pressure. But, uh, but for many years, uh, out, even centuries, the, the, the large proportion of Andalus society was non-Muslim, which is, which is very important, especially to take into consideration what happened after the Reconquista where, where Muslims were forcibly converted or forced to leave. So this is one of the very important moments which I often remind to my students and, and let them remember about, 
about uh, the, the tolerance of various faiths in different historical concept, uh, contexts and, and that we should remember about that. What is, what is very interesting, what is happening nowadays in Europe a little bit is, is this talk about Islam as the forgotten pillar of European civilization. It is only recently after the Second World War then the Jewish heritage was really acknowledged as an important pillar of the European civilization. I believe in the, in the next uh, couple of decades, this discussion will be only um, stronger and these arguments will be made uh, even more um, persuasively, I would say, to show how important the the, was the impact of the Muslim presence in Europe to various types of, uh, of revolutions taking place during the Renaissance. So the green uh, revolution, bringing irrigation and new uh, crops, the contribution in medicine, absolutely um, monumental, contribution in geography and in mathematics. All of this uh, has been passed uh, to uh, Europeans, obviously, uh, and uh, and it's uh, and it's increasingly acknowledged as, as a super important element of of European civilization and and this and and this uh, this uh, this, is, uh, this is also important from the Muslim citizenship point of view, where Muslims want to in a way show their anchoring in the in the European cultural sphere, but also historical sphere in, to 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 large extent. Um, so the current situation uh, in, in, in Europe looks like this, uh, is seen on this map. It's one of the very good maps, which is prepared by, by my colleague and, and other uh, researchers working for the Pew Research Center that show that it must, the, the religious demographics uh, in Europe and in, and in this in demographics, the, the size of Muslim populations and the percentage, the importance in, in given populations. Um, what is obviously very uh, tricky, and I'll say a little bit more about that, is that uh, often these are not um, uh, census data, what is, what is being presented here, and these are estimations. And the estimations are especially tricky in a situation where we are talking about the second, third, fourth generation of Muslims, as we have them nowadays in Europe, and, uh, and no data being collected on the uh, religious affiliation of the citizens of a given European country. So, so this is, is, is very, very problematic. And I'll say a little bit more on this while, while I discuss the case of France, Germany, Great Britain, especially because I'll focus on these countries. And, uh, but I'll also tell you a little bit about, about the smaller place, uh, such as a place from where I talk to you now, which is Poland, which as you can see, has a Muslim population that, that, that doesn't account even for 0.1% or it's around that number, uh, which is a super small uh, population. So the total, according to the estimations from as you can see 2016, and the situation is super dynamic. To be honest, one of the most important elements of my lectures I need to always update is, is this uh, how quickly these things change and I'll tell you a little bit as, as well how why it changes uh, in various countries and probably you are aware of, of, of what what are the causes but but sometimes they are also straightforward so how this happened that Muslims nowadays uh, constitute such an important part of European societies um, it has happened through mainly uh, uh, three phases of immigration that was taking part, especially after the Second World War. As I said, the immigration takes place in the case of France, for example, UK, already before the Second World War. But it's but the 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 social reality, the demographic reality we're talking about today, is above all the result of the migration processes that have been taking place after the Second World War. Uh, which took place through these three phases, which was the, the pioneers that stayed of mostly after the Second World War while fighting, for example, for, for allied armies um, due to chain migration that started uh, later and the reunification of families that happened after the petrol crisis in, in the 70s and later the, the fourth phase, which is, which is now 
mostly uh, accounted uh, mention is the asylum seekers face, uh, which I'll say a little bit later as well. But before I tell you more about France, uh, UK and uh, in Germany, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about this, the community, which has been of a slightly different making. And we shouldn't forget about these communities, which are sometimes small, but sometimes big. As you can see, for example, on this map, I'll just return for a second. There is a, there's a Muslim population of Bulgaria. You can see one of the largest proportion of Muslims when it comes to the whole population, over 11%. So, um, so this is also, this is the, the obviously the, the third phase from the historical perspective, the, the Ottoman Empire in a way um, uh, result of the fact that it was uh, partially uh, it was on this territory. But in the case of Poland, it's, it's even, even earlier history. The Tatars uh, in the Polish Lithuanian um, Commonwealth, uh, they have been, they've been living within this uh, territory it's uh, for, for almost uh, 600 years. So it's super long uh, history. Uh, and uh, and uh, they constitute today a small part of the Muslim population in Poland, but very important part. Um, so it's around 5,000 people. But I, then we have important uh, group of uh, Polish Muslims, uh, immigrants who are already naturalized and their offspring, basically, second, third generation, and also people who embrace Islam, uh, which, uh, which is around 10,000. And then we have a lot of different types of Muslim immigrants, students, professionals, businessmen, refugees, who have arrived to, to Poland in the last, um, in the last um, decades. So the whole population makes up around 0 0.1, as you can say, 40, uh, around 40,000. People. It's a small community, but very diverse, super diverse, um, and uh, and this uh, uh, organizational landscape shows you the the, the diversity of, of the population. So the Tatars uh, is a very important uh, group that uh, were the the most were the only Muslims before the Second World War, and now the minority within the larger population that is made up by by this huge diversity and also very big di religious diversity. So Sunni, Shias, also, also uh, of different, uh, of different uh, um, religious, for example, Sufi orders. So quite uh, interesting uh, diversity here. But what, so this, this is the, the historical, so partially historical presence, partially of, of immigrant uh, presence. When it comes to Europe, um, the, the, side, the, the, the populations are big, uh, and uh, but the, 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 the number we are, these are, especially in the case of France, uh, it is to a huge extent estimations because there is no census that would be uh, asking about religious affiliation. So we do not know uh, where, uh, how many Muslims live in France really. Um, and as you can see, the, this is the, the interior of the, of the Mosquée de Paris uh, in the center of, of Paris. And, and you can see it was opened in 1926. It is, it is the, it's this presence that, uh, that is very important from the perspective of building this historical, uh, so it will be soon uh, 100th anniversary of the, of the opening of this mosque. But obviously, as it is the case in many other places in Europe, the mosques are not so elaborate, uh, but they are in the former um, car parks, in, in factories. So this is the case of, for example, uh, Masjid Abdawa, uh, uh, in, uh, and, uh, and that's where uh, a lot of uh, Muslim communities, how they function. And the largest part when it comes to ethnic groups in the case of France are obviously people from Maghreb, uh, but also very important uh, presence of also Turks and, and in recent years, a very important uh, arrival of many uh, Muslims from Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, quite interesting numbers of, of, uh, of uh, high, one of the highest numbers of, of people embracing Islam and the biggest centers, obviously here are some of the cities mentioned, these are the biggest concentrations of Muslims in France, but, but obviously Muslims are spread all over this territory. Um, when it comes to Germany, there's been a very high 
uh, rise of the of the Muslim population in Germany in recent years, especially after 2015 and uh, and the reception of a significant number of Syrian uh, refugees. So in that sense, the, the Muslim population has very significantly grown over the last decade, in the last decade, but still the Turks uh, constitute the largest groups. Now, now Syrians would be probably the, the second largest, but they are a huge diversity. So before one of the biggest uh, influx of Muslims to Europe was during the, the Bosnian war and then Bosnians are obviously a very important part. Here, the largest, the, the, I show you the photo of, of the mosque uh, of the Ahmadiyya movement in Wilmersdorf uh, quarter, which is the oldest uh, in, in Germany. Very small, um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but beautiful um, masjid in, uh, in Wilmersdorf uh, district of, of Berlin. So these are some of the cities, obviously, again, Muslims are everywhere. When, we come to, uh, when it comes to, Gem to, to Great Britain, it's a very interesting case because Muslim population is one of the only countries where we have a very precise data uh, on how many Muslims live in, in the UK. Um, and the uh, uh, Muslim population is obviously of um, uh, mainly South Asian origin, but I'll show you how the situation is changing over the last years. And here I'll also show you some interesting graphs there were, uh, this is a, a result of the re research by uh, social ge geographers from Oxford with whom I cooperate at certain moments uh, that showed the, the, the proportion of various types of mosques. And you can see on this um, that, uh, that only 20% um, of the mosques in, uh, in the UK are purpose-built mosques. Otherwise, the vast majority are uh, converted type, different types of the buildings. And according to this research, it's quite old, but I don't know the, the, the newest research on that. At that time, this was 2005, I think, when Karipic was doing this research. Then was, uh, at that time, uh, the, the churches uh, constituted one fifth of the mosques in, in the UK. And here you have a photo of one of the oldest ones in, in Dewsbury the place where the Tabliki Jama movement has its headquarters in, in, in Europe. Um, and this is the result of, the, of what, what is possible with the very detailed uh, census data in the case of UK. Uh, it is possible to see where precisely Muslims live in which parts of London. This is the, on the basis of the 2001 census, but there's been obviously latest centers and the latest is 2011 and this is super interesting because having the census from 2001 and 2011 we can see the the, the change that has been taking place in the country so what what we see as a change is it's obviously this very dynamic growth of the of the muslim community but above all what is what is the biggest the change visible is this this largest sort of uh, dark area here is the the growth of non-religious, so non-religious people as the largest religion in a case uh, of, 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 of UK. And here you can see how the Muslim populations in various uh, Muslim cities has been growing. So it is not a surprise that, that now the city of London has a Muslim mayor. Uh, why? Because Muslims in 2011, they made up already 12% of the population of London. Over one million people in London are Muslims, uh, but the the largest uh, uh, when it comes to the borders, you know, it's it's about how the borders are drawn. But, but the largest uh, Muslim presence can be seen in the city uh, of Bradford, where every fourth person in the city nowadays is uh, is is Muslim. And you can see how also this has been changing over over a decade. Uh, increased uh, in the case of Bradford for 8% and in the case of London, uh, almost uh, 4%. So a very, very significant growth. And here you can see, and this is very important uh, table, I show it in order to, um, to, to make aware people, in especially uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and elsewhere, how about the change in the Muslim population in Europe, namely that this population, it's often still referred as immigrant, uh, Muslim immigrants. But, but here you can see that 47% of Muslims in 2011, so almost a, de a decade ago, 
were born in the UK. So they were, they were, they, they were, they were, uh, it means that this is a British uh, Muslim uh, population, much more than, than, uh, than immigrant population, that people were, were, were uh, uh, born somewhere else. And the last slide from, from this data about the ethnicity of Muslim population, you can see here how, for example, we know that South Asians obviously make up the largest part of the of the of the British uh, population, but you can see that the, the the proportion in the in the whole Muslim community is decreasing. In 2001, they made up almost three fourths of the community, 74 percent almost. While in uh, 2011, they have uh, gone down to 67 uh, percent. So, and you can see. Uh, from where uh, else uh, Muslims um, refer from, uh, what are their origins when it comes to the UK. And it's, it's very fascinating data because there are not many um, countries which have this type of data. So what happens, which you could see on the basis of this, of this table, is that Muslims, as I, as I claim already in 2007 in the book, is Muslims stop being immigrants in, in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. And we see a very clear transformation from Islam, which is mainly of religion of immigrants, to Islam being religion of citizens. And this has a very important um, uh, implications. What, what, when it comes to immigrants, they often are, they cherish myth of return. A lot of them still think about the fact that they will return back to their countries, even how it sometimes happens is that they are being sent back after they after they die in Europe. They they express their will to be sent back to the countries of origin, and that's how it happens. But most this is one thing. Another element is the la double absence um, described by Abdel Malik Sayyad, being uh, physically in the in in Europe, but mentally longing to the countries of origin to some extent, and not having, for example, and this is linked and having scarce cultural capital of um, understanding the realities of the countries, like very in-depth understanding of the, of the realities, language, culture of the countries where, 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 in, where they live. When it comes to the children, the second, third, fourth generations, they're not thinking about moving to their private countries of origin. Sometimes it does happen. We see some movement, but, uh, but most of them do not think about that. They are characterized by very strong attachment to local and sometimes national identities. And this is part of a Muslim citizenship that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And they possess substantial cultural capital, which is a super important element. So what I, what I, what I show is a transformation in Islam in Europe is, is going from Islam of immigrants to Islam of citizens, where at the level of religion and ethnicity, the, 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 when it comes to immigrants, there are very strong relationships. So being a Pakistani uh, immigrant, Pakistani origin, for example, means in a, in a way ex definizione that someone is a Muslim. When, when one is a British Pakistani, then it's not so certain that that, he, that religion and ethnicity must be must be linked. So there's a weakening relationship. When it comes to the place of religion, um, up until the arrival of families in the 70s, uh, um, Muslim presence in Europe has been described as hidden presence. Why? Mostly because uh, uh, the, it was uh, uh, linked with men who worked and, for example, prayed in their factories. Uh, and uh, and they did not. They have a very limited interactions with the host societies. When the families were brought, they the in a way European societies have shown that that uh, that, uh, that they've realized uh, that they've they've noticed the the religious uh, difference in a way. And religion became part of the public sphere. Here, the key moment is is the Rajdi affair, uh, end of eighties, and uh, the, the same time the. The, um, uh, the the Fulah affair, as it's called, the, the hijab affair in France, that has been ongoing basically since the end of eight, uh, end, end of eighties. And what we see that uh, this is the latest element is, is linked with the Gellner's characterizations, which is quite strongly um, uh, criticized about low Islam linked with with more elements of of magic. Of, uh, of, uh, of, for example, ritualism, of, 
um, and and the and less understanding of scripture and uh, and the, in the case of the citizens uh, having better understanding of the of Arabic and better understanding of, 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 of Islamic scripture. And this, is, this has to do, for example, with the choice the immigrant family members are making, whether they want the children to learn Turkish, Bosnian, uh, Urdu, Punjabi, or they want the children to, to have a good understanding of Arabic. And often the choice is that they want the children to, to have Sometimes they want both, both, but sometimes it does happen that, that this understanding of Arabic is, is, is bigger. So what happens with the second and third generation is that that religion, religious identities, they become they they uh, become increasingly they have a personal character. And uh, what I describe in my research, and this is a, a, an excerpt from one of the interviews, intellectually it's not good enough that my parents' forefathers were Muslims. I had to be convinced, otherwise I would choose to abandon Muslim life and follow the life which many Westerners live. So it was this intellectual thinking process that led me to the conclusion that there is God. So this, this, what you see is, is, is there's a process of, of reinventing themselves. And, and as part of this, this reinvention of Muslim, of, 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 of being Muslim and Islam in Europe is partially linked to the process that I won't be touching so much during my lecture today, but, but I will be hinting this to you because this is, these are the absolutely crucial and critical moments when sometimes the reinvention goes, goes wrong, wrong way. And uh, by, by, by reinvention going wrong way, I mean uh, the processes of radicalization and I mean uh, people who embrace uh, 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 non-dialogical, uh, and basically embrace violence in order in order to achieve certain uh, certain goals. Acknowledge of the Muslim habitus is very interesting. Um, uh, among the second and third generation, so it, it, it is there, and you can see it in this in this expert, which which says that 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 this person, in a way, that that, that parents did have impact, and they framed in a way. Uh, framed uh, second and third generation, and the last bit of this is, is very is very nice. When they, when this uh, Faisal from Brussels says that that they practically did it through silence. So in a way, through this upbringing in the in the Muslim traditions. Um, but this has to do with the with the with the also with the type of Islam that was that was practiced by by first generation. Uh, Muslims often from from various types of rural backgrounds that, that came to uh, to Europe, stressing the incompleteness of the religious education. My parents are not the parents that would give me all the religion to their to their children. So and and here is the critical I would say uh, uh, critical um, uh, um, so, so opinion from Kemal in Brussels, who said we have more and more Muslims now that come to Islam through their own paths. And some of them become arrogant. They say, "We know the truth; you don't know it." Yeah. So this is this is the reinvention still the, the reinvention do-it-yourself biography. Um, and as I as I put a, as you hear a, an equal um, mark that they are risky biographies, especially risky biographies in a way that that if the parents are not able to to lead their children or have no uh, no tools, no um, they are not able to to lead them the way they. Uh, to to rediscover uh, uh, um, this nonviolent, uh, for example, Islam. So this is this is very important. So uh, so to set the scene for the Muslim citizenship, I wanted to quote uh, um, I'll give you a quote from uh, Anwar book, but this is uh, I don't know which hadith is or it's in Quran to be honest. But there will be a time, supposedly said of the prophet, that uh, when your religion will be like a hot piece of coal in the palm of your hand, you will not be able to hold it. I imagine probably this would be a uh, Meccan period uh, um, uh, where obviously um, Muslims uh, uh, were perceived as a, as a, as a sect and, and, as a, uh, and, uh, and as dangerous. So in a way, but this is, I think, the, this historical, in a way, uh, uh, um, piece obviously very nicely shows the, the current situation where Muslims in Europe 
especially are a very under big st pressure of stigmatization uh, as a result of uh, various types of uh, terrorist attacks, but at the same time, increasing mobilization of young European Muslims around religious identity. And, and uh, as my friends, um, Professor Busetta and Jacobs noticed in 2006, paradoxically, the radicalism of jihadist discourse of Bin Laden and his followers has st stimulated a form of civic consciousness among Muslims. Um, so what I, what I have been dis uh, researching is this construction of a new type of project identity in a way. And, and from my perspective, this Muslim citizenship is this type of, uh, of, of uh, Muslim uh, or Muslim civicness, as I, as I call it, a move um, from, from the Muslim identity, politics of Muslim identity, largely based on the emphasis of otherness towards politics of Muslim citizenship that is increasingly uh, stresses the elements of sameness. And, and in this process, what is being done is the, that uh, the stigma uh, uh, is being turned into a source of empowerment. Uh, and, and it's possible because Islam is such an important uh, cultural um, and religious and other type of space that, that can be taken from and, and important for identity. But it's important also to see the revival of the talk about citizenship in a larger perspective. And this revival of the notion of citizenship in the public academic debates is a result, I would say, of, of process of globalization, enlargement of the EU, especially in Europe, of the EU, erosion of the boundaries of identities of the nation states. You may say revival of nationalism to some extent, but also there is this erosion. We cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, um, uh, we cannot say that it doesn't exist. And generally, disengagement of individuals from political process. This is one of the, as uh, Zygmunt Bauman very importantly said, one of the biggest um, threats to uh, to a citizen to to citizenship in a way is individualism above all. The fact that individuals, the persons that are searching for their own ego and not looking at others around. And, and what I've been doing is I've been looking at the sociological citizenship following Delante and Turner. So looking at not only at the uh, level of uh, obligations and rights, but also identity and participation dimensions of citizenship. And before I tell you about my research, the, the results of it, uh, it's also important to, to understand why so often um, religion is seen as in opposition to citizenship. And these are some of the reasons I, I, I've, I've discovered in literature and I believe are, are important. One of them is, is historical definition of a civil society as it, as it was formulated by Thomas Hobbes, where, where he sees civil society as alternative to the kingdom and the church, as alternative to the power of the, of the state and, and the religion in a way. And, and in this dimension, often citizenship is seen as something that religion has nothing to do with. Awareness of religious diversity in contemporary societies and the difficulty of reaching agreement on common definition of what is a good life. Uh, and finally, evidence from social reality especially as it is sown by sensational media, various types of conflicts, and there's no way that I can have a, a Muslim, Hindu, a Sikh, whoever as a, as a neighbor, because we surely would not find a common ground. Yeah? But what we also see from, 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 um, from research, that religion has a, such an important uh, uh, um, uh, uh, role to citizenship. Citizenship as, as an achievement that religious organizations help to bring about. There's plenty of re research on that. And some of the potential of religious contributions to different dimensions of citizenship are the following. In the case of identity, forging connections across large segments of the population um, being such an important force. In terms of participatory dimension, providing an institutional basis for political mobilization and acting as educator and generator of social capital. I cannot say it's more strongly from where I am in the case of Poland, for example, where the fall of communism and the success of the solidarity movement 
is completely unthinkable without the Catholic Church. Uh, and in many places in the world, the, 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 the religion is such an important element of, of the mobilization and, and participation of people in, in, uh, in, this, in this sense. And in the case of normative dimension, inspiring many emancipatory movements, nurturing sensibilities that give public life a philosophical and spiritual depth that give the, the meaning uh, of, of, of what, what it means to, to be a citizen in a way. And in the, in the case of, of Europe, um, one of the key things that I was uh, trying to look at is, is how, what, what it means to be, what it means to be a, a Muslim and a citizen in a way, uh, and how, how this, uh, uh, how these things are, are connected. And obviously, and to some extent, I was, I was, I was here uh, in my research, I was also looking at how various ideas put forward by persons such as Tari Gramadan, but he's one of many preachers in, uh, mostly preachers now um, uh, in the past, especially um, active in, in Europe that have been preaching uh, this uh, devout citizenship, uh, Muslim type of citizenship, self-identification as Muslim and citizen. Muslims have to be loyal to their countries. Muslims should have positive emotional attitude to the countries and extensive knowledge about them. And, and, uh, and Muslims are not born to be observers, a very sort of dynamic, uh, uh, also active, I would say, uh, citizenship. And what I looked in my research, I looked at the Belgian and British case, uh, and I tried to look and explore uh, exactly this links between Islam and active social citizenship in these two cases. And, uh, and I, for that, I, I, I've done, as you can see, the research of over 60 interviews um, and, uh, and look at these various dimensions. So uh, in the case of uh, the identity, how do young Muslims conceive of their civic and Muslim identities and frame their belonging? At the level of uh, uh, participation, how do young Muslims account for activism in the Muslim organization and in the wider public sphere? How do young Muslims view their rights as citizens at the level of uh, content or rights and obligations? How do young Muslims perceive their obligations as citizens? And in the last uh, quickly 10 minutes, I want to show you some of the results of this research. So I have, um, Sort of shown that a, a very significant proportion of this uh, of this person's young second and third generation Muslims who have not abandoned Islam but have been using it creatively uh, in various Muslim organizations and non-Muslim organizations is that for them when it comes to identity they very strongly feel um, uh, that, uh, that they are both, that they are Muslims and also nationals of a given country. And it's, my research was mostly qualitative, but, but there's been so many other Ipsos Mori and other research that show a super strong attachment of, the, of Muslims in Europe to their local communities and to national projects. So stressing the importance of identification, with compatriots and national culture and heritage to a large extent. Uh, then uh, what is uh, happening, they, uh, they, uh, they say, for example, I'm very comfortable being British and Muslim in the case of Kadir in London. Or Hadija who said, you cannot cut someone in the middle and say that this part belongs to citizenship and then to religion. Muslimness and citizenship are inseparable entities. And I think these are some of the quotes very nicely shows this this manifestation uh, of, uh, in, in the case of identity. When it comes to participation, is, is activism that, that's beyond the Muslim symbolic boundaries. And what I mean by that is there's very strong engagement to, to, to willingness to engage in non-Muslim causes as well. So for example, Murat said in Brussels, if a Jew is attacked, Muslims have to fight with the injustice done to him as if, as if he was a Muslim. If they spoke about injustice in the world, which they did, they, they were not only concentrated about, about various places of conflicts, but also saw the problems of injustice much more globally and not limited to only Muslims somewhere. Uh, this is one of the problems of, of, of radicalizations that, that for example, Mohammed uh, Sidi Khan, the ringleader of the, of the 7-7 bombers, 
he super strongly in the context obviously of of the of the war being carried out in Iraq by part uh, by 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 UK but he super strongly obviously attached with this uh, with this uh, with this uh, with with uh, with Muslims elsewhere but then with Muslims in the in 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 the UK uh, when it comes to rights there's an emphasis on the on the same it's quite interestingly a lot of the of the of the Muslims in Belgium and Europe they uh, they said that Muslims have uh, rights to, for example, Muslim schools, halal food, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, they were ready to resign from the rights to parity, for example, and uh, and they were ready uh, um, to, for, to, for example, right to state-funded religious school in the case of UK. And uh, their requests uh, had a character of the acculturative demands, I would say, rather the dissociative ones, like the dissociating themselves from larger society. And when it comes to obligations, there was a very strong emphasis on the obligations vis-a-vis -vis all the citizens without distinction of creed, which is super important. A and, 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 and linked with that, a very high compatibility between the obligations of citizenship and demands of the faith. So for example, Nabiha from Brussels said, our work should profit not only Muslims, but also others. Or some are from London who said the obligations of citizens is not to contribute, uh, is, sorry, is, is to contribute to the society, to do something meaningful, not only make a difference to my life, but to make difference to lives of others. And by others, it was very strongly meant that, that these others should be, should be everybody else. In the opposition of this, of this Muslim civicness, what you can see also in Europe is, is a model which I call here uncompromising Muslimness. And, and this is the second, the second, uh, the, the other part of a spectrum in a way. And, and that's, that's where some margins of, of Muslim populations in Europe have found themselves in recent decades, where they have, for example, Super strongly, um, uh, they they for example said that the the national project, the fact of, of of being part of the of the British society or German society, it's something worthless. It's something that uh, that uh, that they were they were not uh, happy about at all, um, and preached for example um, the the importance. And obviously, you are very very well aware of the of various groups. Um, that, that, that preach, for example, dismissal of, of national projects such as uh, Hizbut Tahrir. Activism largely within the Muslim symbolic boundaries, unwillingness in this part of participation, unwillingness to engage uh, for non-Muslim causes. So the only what matters is, 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 is to fight and to be active within this, the boundaries. When it comes to rights, it's emphasis on the rights of difference, unwillingness to resign from, a, from the right to, to parity and very strong dissociated, uh, uh, dissociative uh, demands. And finally, when it comes to obligations, there is uh, uh, what characterizes this, uh, this, uh, this type of, of, uh, of attitude is, uh, is uh, priority being given to obligations to Muslim Ummah only, and, and claiming also that there is uh, uh, often uh, uh, incompatibility between the obligations uh, of citizenship and demands of the faith, that, that I cannot be uh, Muslim and British at the same time, that, that, that these two things are completely incompatible and, and cannot, cannot be linked. So, uh, um to, to to go towards the end what what i've been showing that this uh, this muslim civicness is is a way of of uh, as, a, as a type of a project identity where 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 it in a way redefines the social position of muslims uh, engage uh, in it and and development uh, and transforms the social structure and how it does it by by challenging the traditional public-private sphere divide. And here, what I mean is that this, this uh, popular understanding of the role of religion in the public life and the fact that, that some, some um, persons say that, uh, that there is no role for, for religion in, in the public life, while at the same time, 
various religions do have historical role and they're very much part and parcel of this public life. Why the, the new religious groups, uh, when they come, their role is being, is being seen as, as, they, as a challenge, but that's what it does. And calling for the transformation of the existing power structures between the established and outsiders. So, so in a way, Muslims are not uh, immigrants uh, uh, outside the, those who come, but those who are part and parcel of uh, of, um, of of Muslim um, of, of European societies. And here, with, with the last slide, to conclude, um, I show you some of the um, some of the. I cannot tell you because this is part of the anonymity, but some of the, the persons who are on the cover of this uh, Time magazine from 2008 are, are persons that I've been interviewing and you've heard during, during my lecture, their, um, their, uh, their opinions. They are uh, what I call in, in the book, new Muslim uh, elites, but this is, these elites are, are very much part of the European society today. And as you could see the figures, the, 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 the majority of Muslims in Europe are, are European born, are part of, of European um, politics, European societies, hugely contributing uh, to these societies. And obviously we see, we see, uh, we see Sadiq Khan, a mayor of London, we see important uh, parts, but sometimes it is, it is the, the everyday life activists of, of, of many, of millions of others that, that makes this society, European societies work. And like this fantastic news from recent months are enabling us to, to, uh, to go through such an important crisis as we go through now, which is the, the pandemic. And here is the, the photo of Ugur Sahin, and Ozelem Tureci, obviously, that you've probably heard about, who are one of the founders of the biotech company that has produced the, 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 the one of the, um, one of the uh, cures, uh, possible cures uh, um, for, uh, for COVID. So uh, Turkish origin um, immigrants in Germany who have, who have uh, uh, so greatly contributed to the possible uh, end to, to the pandemic. So emergence of the European born Muslim elite that is able to translate their religion into the language understood by non-Muslim members of a given society, I think is one of the most important developments within these communities in recent uh, decades. And this improvement of the situation of Muslim and, the, and, and the, the more larger improvement of the Muslim communities in Europe will depend not only on the uh, effective struggle against at least some of the forms of exclusion and here and Islamophobia here is, is crucial and disadvantages uh, faced by members of, of Muslim communities, but also the result of Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim efforts to reinvent and reposition themselves as citizens and full members of uh, European polities. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Connard, for this very comprehensive, informative and uh, uh, constructive uh, uh, lecture on Islam and uh, Muslim citizenship in Europe. Your lecture has uh, many um, demographic and also in-depth uh, interviews and uh, uh, responses of uh, Muslim individuals in Europe, and which offers, I think, uh, it's very um, uh, both broad and uh, deep un understanding of uh, Muslim communities and Muslim life and uh, citizenship in, the, in Europe. So we do have uh, two questions from the audience. Um, uh, one thing I think from our, we've heard a lot of these days, uh, uh, being claiming that European Muslims are facing uh, integration problems. They have been marginalized. They have been considered like, uh, as in your slide, you said they were mostly considered immigrant. And uh, maybe the process of uh, 
like uh, being a civic citizen are happening, but still on the media and from outside, we saw much of this, uh, uh, the, the same as they are facing integration problems. So how, based on your research and uh, observation, how serious this problem is? Like, is it real? If not, then why there's such a media coverage of this issue? Uh, why there's such a huge coverage? Obviously, this has to do with the with the with the philosophy and character of the of the contemporary media. It's uh, it's the sensational uh, data, uh, sensational information. Uh, this is what sells. So so obviously, all types of uh, of um, incidents and mini uh, clashes of civilizations is something that sells best. Uh, an everyday mundane, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, peaceful uh, coexistence is something that doesn't sell. So this is one of the reasons, obviously, that, that we hear so much. Another very important element of that is that, that nowadays also we live in in cognitive uh, bubbles, which is linked with the algorithm and the ways how we are, how the information is being uh, given to us through, for example, social media. It's not that all social media contribute to Islamophobia to, to, to the same extent. As research from, uh, for example, University of Warsaw shows, it's mostly um, social media uh, uh, that has the huge, uh, the, the, the biggest impact on, on, make, on building prejudicial attitudes uh, towards uh, all types of groups, not uh, qualitative uh, good uh, newspapers. But as we know, this these are in crisis and, and there are uh, um, fewer viewers, fewer readers of, of these newspapers. So um, the, the, the issues are, are super complex uh, when it comes to why we hear about this, uh, um, this, uh, these problems. Uh, but also, obviously, it doesn't mean that the, the problems do not exist. Uh? The questions of, of the problems of integration, the problems of, of radicalization, they are very real uh, at the same time. Uh, and, uh, but they require, they require a very um, uh, well-informed policies. Uh, and, and also, uh, they require certain strategies to, to tackle them. from all kinds of levels from the perspective of families, communities, religious organizations. I think the obligations are on everyone and uh, on, on, on every level in a way. Uh, but, uh, but what is, what is, what is the, the and, op, and, and clearly the, the making it sensational and, and talking about Muslims bringing uh, problems, it is something that is not uh, uh, solving the, the, the issues, but making it even more problematic right? and showing, for example, as I did uh, during my presentation at the, at the end, the, some of the so many success stories within, within the, the, the Muslim histories in Europe is, is one, of the, one of the ways of also inspiring uh, young European Muslims uh, and showing them uh, various types of, of strategies uh, of uh, of life and, and the reinvention of Muslimness, as I as I as I have uh, uh, stated in my lecture. Great, you are also expert on population. So again, there's a lot of uh, um, either scholarly articles or even media um, report about European being um, Islam uh, Islamized will be will be let's say in like twenty yeah. years, fifty years. Yeah. Uh, even you know you see some social media they make a very um, a sensational claim that all oh, Europe will become Europe's Europe stand or Frank, yes. Frank Francis stand. Yeah. So from the population uh, as a you know gross perspective, uh, how real this claim is, or is it just nonsense? Yeah, perfect question. Um, uh, yes, and I, I also said in, in in the lecture that I will. Uh, tell you more about about the, the the reasons behind the growth of the Muslim population in the UK, and I and I and I didn't mm -hmm. do it. Uh, so um, obviously, the the film circulating in uh, in the um, in the uh, uh, on the on the internet, YouTube, 
there are so many of them and they are so much, so often, so many of them have nothing to do with realities. To some extent, um, I would say, I say to my colleagues from Pew Research that, uh, that they are partially part of the problem. They, they, try, they do excellent work in terms of trying to provide us with this uh, religious demographics, not only concerning Muslim presence in Europe, but concerning other religious uh, demographics. That, that's what we do within Caspar. Um, but, uh, but obviously what all types of, as, 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 as the very important saying says, uh, lies, damn lies and statistics, obviously, Statistics needs to be well understood. We need to understand the context. We need to understand how the models are being built. Because what is what, what we are talking about, okay, when, when, I, when we take this data from the British census, we have a hard data, we have affiliation that that many hundred thousand people said, the million, uh, millions in 2001 that they feel affiliation to Islam. And then what we see the figures from 2011 and, and what, how it happened. It happened as a result of uh, the Muslim populations in Europe are generally younger than the average Muslim uh, other, the, uh, the, the rest of the society in a way. So by having younger populations, there is a much bigger potential for growth. But it, it's not true that the Muslim women have for uh, that have total fertility rate four, five, six. It hardly exists nowadays. There are, there are few, very few countries that have so high fertility rates. Chad is one of them, for example. The, the poorest country you get uh, that often would have the, the highest, which is linked obviously with traditional history, whatever. Uh, the, but what is important here is that we see that the total fertility rate is decreasing, but still, but there is, for example, in the case of UK, the, the, the youngest of the, of the population, slightly higher fertility rate of, of, of around one child per, per woman. But importantly, immigration still is, is important. In the, even in this uh, Muslim Council of Britain report, it was not uh, shown, but my later research showed that there's been over 100,000 uh, 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 immigrants who have come within a decade from Pakistan, for example, or Bangladesh uh, to UK. Uh, so the immigration is still part uh, of it. In the case of Germany, so importantly, the asylum seekers and the, the, the war in, in Syria that have contributed to the situation. So, so these are some of the reasons why the Muslim populations will be growing faster than, than, than other type of communities in Europe. And by this, that's, that's one of the major reasons why Muslim populations are growing. But one of the things that demographers from, also from pure, pure, pure research are not able to figure out is the so-called uh, religious switching. So we do not know how many of, the, of, of Muslims today will be still practicing not even practicing, but, but feeling any affiliation to Islam in the future. That's something that no demographer knows about. So the, when the models are being built, they are built on the notion, on the knowledge that we have from today, not, not on the basis of what people are being asked and how they feel. And, and one of the elements that is totally unknown is the process of secularization of, of Muslims uh, in Europe. This is uh, one of the biggest probably questions in, a, in uh, one of the biggest questions in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the academia, in the research on, on Muslims Europe, the, the progress of the secularization processes in, in Europe. And there's some research in Sweden, colleagues from Southern University have been already uh, researching, for example, the, the secular Islam, what it means to be to be secular, to be non non practicing Muslim, and increasing number of Muslims are uh, non practicing, and and also feeling less affiliation. So so these are the some of the very big questions which we have, which which do not allow us to say with certainty how the populations will be growing, and obviously we do not know. Uh, 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 anything about the possible 
impact of migration from where the migrants can come and where the impact can be on given uh, on given population on a given country, such as, for example, the, the case of Germany and a big influx of of uh, Syrian refugees that has changed the structure and the shape of the of the Muslim population in Germany. Great, thank you so much. Uh, last but not least question, um, we would like to hear you that uh, for uh, European Muslim communities, uh, if we are really facing this uh, rather integration challenges or this uh, media um, unfriendliness, what they, they can do by themselves, you know? Yes, of course, there, they, we should expect the government to give some good policies or the mm -hmm. scholars to mm -hmm. have more responsible to give her beta, better data. But can Muslim communities, Muslim leaders in Europe countries, including your, your own country, mm -hmm. can they do something? Uh, mm -hmm. Or is there a model they can mm -hmm. look at, okay, this is how we should be doing and we should mm -hmm. um, keep the civic uh, civicness and our religious identity in the same time or like we can uh, in integrate better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think one of the uh, the the most important strategies is building uh, building partnerships. So so when the um, when the mosque is being uh, vandalized, uh, the the if the if the if the communities are cohesive, if these partnerships are being built, then. Uh, in the case of any uh, harm done to any member of a larger community, regardless of their faith, the help comes from other members of the community. So in a way, if in, the, in this case, most being vandalized, the members of other religious communities, if they are in partnership with, 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 uh, with, uh, with Muslim religious leaders, then they can uh, then they, uh, they, they, for example, well, they repair the mosque. In the same, in the same situation, if if any, uh, it is in any in any trouble is done to synagogue, uh, temple, gurdwara, or any kind of secure uh, sacred building. Huh? Um, and but but what obviously uh, this the the partnership needs to be built not. Not only on the basis of, of religious uh, organizations, on the these partnerships are built on the on the very much human basis. Like I, I may think about um, about the late uh, Mufti of uh, of the Muslim League in Poland, uh, who unfortunately uh, passed away um, last month due to COVID. So he was, for example, very uh, active. In uh, in interfaith interreligious dialogue and uh, and obviously uh, this was being noticed and and it was easier for for him and for Muslims in general to translate what is the problem about Muslims Muslim uh, anti-Muslim racism why Islamophobia is uh, why certain way of talking about Muslims in Islam is problematic um, so obviously. I, as I say, these this partnerships, I think, need to be built on all levels. And I think this is the only, the only way how, how, uh, how problems uh, such as, uh, such as uh, Islamophobia can be, can be tackled. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Koran, for this excellent uh, lecture and uh, great Q, uh, Q and A. And especially uh, your answer again is, uh, very informative and instructive. Uh, thanks again, dear viewers and um, uh, subscribers of the World Muslim Community Council. Thanks again for attending this lecture and we hope to see you in the future uh, events. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.